Robinson. The great John Robinson. <laughs> yeah. Why I thought I was a golden boy is pretty simple. Uh, I have more talent in my little finger than most people have in their entire body. Scored almost a perfect 1600 on my SAT in high school. I was runner up for Mr. Basketball in the state of North Carolina. I was the MVP of the North Carolina State High School Basketball Championship game in 1977. I went to University of Maryland on a uh, full basketball scholarship, athletic scholarship, played for the legendary Lefty Drizel, who's still one of my best friends and uh, one of my mentors. Uh, I played professional basketball overseas uh, in South America, went on to be a famous television news anchor, <laughs> if that means anything. I was the voice of the Carolina Panthers for 15 years at Bank of America Stadium was the morning man for Charlotte's Morning News at News Talk 1110 WBT Radio. I uh, have two beautiful sons. I've had uh, two amazing wives, uh, an incredible family. I am uh, an amputee. I'm a cancer survivor, and uh, I am a recovering addict. And I'm still alive. And left to my own devices, uh, I, uh, I didn't lose anything. I gave it all away. Pretty simple. So, so that's part of John's story. And next week you get to hear the rest of it. And we encourage you to... Invite people that are close to you that are in tension, they're stressed out, they're in transition, they're going from one place to another in their life, which always causes stress, and they're in trouble. Certainly he's been that way. One of the great things that we've been talking about in, during this whole series is that God uses imperfect people to do his perfect plan. Now, one of the things that I think about when I listen to John talk is, God, why didn't you give me that voice and I could have really been a preacher? Wow, what a great voice, right? Today I want to introduce you to another imperfect person. Thank you other people for coming in. If you just make room for them as they come in and make them feel welcome. I want to introduce you to my old friend David. He is the shepherd boy who killed the giant Goliath, who became the, the king of Israel and then a very imperfect father and someone who came or gave in to lust at a moment of weakness with a woman named Bathsheba. As a matter of fact, when you think about David, David is always paired with one of two people. Okay, the first one is David and, right? And the second one is ba David and, that's right, that's my Bathsheba imitation, right? I can't be more suggestive than that. I don't look anything like her. So here's the thing I want to share with you today. Over the next 22 minutes or so, we're going to talk about my old friend David. I wish there was time for me to share with you what you can learn every day from the scriptures about what David has had to say to us. As a matter of fact, most of the Psalms, which is just a word for songs, is from the Bible. And, and if you're afraid, you could read these words in another place in Psalms, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. If you are somebody that needs forgiveness, you could read, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. When, when you can't sleep at night, you can say, I'll both lay down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, may me dwell in safety. If you need to forgive someone else, you say, forgive others, even as you've forgiven me. If you need guidance, you would understand that he has written already, and he sang a song. There were, there were musical notes to it. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and it's a light to my path. Oh, I wish I had time to talk to you more about David and what else he has to say. But today, we're going to go to a very familiar passage. You ever been afraid? You ever been desperate for God? These are the, the words of the very same man who said, As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants after you. My soul pants after you, the God, the, the living God. Are you desperate for him today? This world is filled with people that are desperate. And not even for those of us who are familiar with him and know about him. There are desperate people in Egypt because they lost their lives and families' lives last night. There are desperate people in Syria and all over this world, and there are desperate people literally 50 yards on this side of this wall who live in desperation. 
we're paying attention. This has to do today with, with both you and it has to do also with others. It has to do with me and it has to do with others. And today we're going to dive in and talk about what David wants us to understand. Here's the first thing that you and I need to do today as we seek to get God's heart. And if there's ever an imperfect person, David was that imperfect person. And yet God called him a man after his own heart. That God went seeking after him through the prophet Samuel. He goes into this family and, and this family basically trots out all the different boys in the family, thinking that they might be the next king. And they're like, isn't there anybody else? And, oh, there's David. He's out carrying the sheep and just caring for them. He was even overlooked when the person came to say, you're going to be the next king. Here's the first thing we need to see today. We need to understand that God wants me, God wants you, God wants us to pursue him, to pursue him. He is the good shepherd, the, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. For you and for me. He made life and life more abundant possible. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by Him. The writer of the book of Acts, the New Testament, reminds us of David's place in God's plan. It says, He, meaning God, raised up for them David as king. To whom also he gave testimony, which is a story. And he said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. I understand last week when Justin Jackson slammed the ball during the national championship run of the Carolina Tar Heels, he had on the back of one heel God's and on the other hand will. I like that. David was that kind of person. He was a conqueror and sometimes he was conquered. He was somebody that was up and sometimes he was down. As a matter of fact, if you read through the Psalms of David, if you start in Psalm chapter 1, by the way, it's easy to find us right in the middle of your Bible. It's even easier to find on your smartphone. If you go to get your U version app, you can just go Psalms and it'll take you there. But if you read the words of David, you go, dude, this dude is up and he is down and he is in the middle. He is so much like me. As a matter of fact, I believe that if David was alive today, there would be certain periods of his life where he would go to see a psychologist and they would diagnose him as being bipolar. He probably would have been medicated. And there are words for you and for me from him. Here's another one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Do you think your life is without purpose? There is purpose in your life like there was purpose in David's life. There is purpose and a purpose for your life like there is a purpose for the most magnified rulers of this world, the most famous celebrities, the most incredible athletes. God has a purpose for you and for me. It says in the book of Acts as well, there's, it's not going to be up on the screen for you, just take my word for it. It says, David fulfilled his purpose in his generation and then he died. <laughs> Oh, that's what I want somebody to say. Doug, would you make sure at my funeral, somebody just says, Ray fulfilled his purpose in this generation, and then he died. Th that's what it's all about. Because this life is nothing but preparation for the next. But we can see David's words no better than one single place than in a psalm called the 23rd Psalm. Ironically, when we think of the 23rd Psalm, here is the place where it's most often read. Where is it? Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, though, David would want you to know, God would want you to know, this is not a psalm for the dead. It is a psalm for the living. It is a psalm to give us the energy when we don't feel like we can get up and go. When we feel like we don't have anybody that's looking out for it is a psalm for living people. Don't memorize it and just recite it at funerals. Listen, I'm not saying that's bad. I did this yesterday. I used this passage yesterday. But today I want to use it for those of us who are still living, fulfilling God's purpose in this generation. First of all, we need to make a choice that gives all, all the time. We need to make one choice that gives all, all the time. Say these words with me from Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Everything starts there. If you've not made that choice, everything else doesn't work in your life. He is the good shepherd who has come to lay down his life for the sheep. But here's the thing. When we get him, we understand that we're going to get everything else in due time. Is there anything in your life that you want more than him? Money, fame, power, pleasure, knowledge, the adulation of people? Or do you 
want him right now. For those of you that don't have him, and you know that that's the story of your life. You've tried everything else, but nothing else has worked. Let me offer you Christ. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, I pray for these here today. and You're calling out to their heart right now. And they have played around with you and played around with life. And today, if you're out there, I want to invite you to say these words with me. Out loud, move your lips, echo them through the, the cauldrons of your heart up into the, the light of heaven. Say, dear God, I've made everything but you, God. And nothing has worked. I repent and I turn toward you. Please forgive me. Help me to follow you. You are my shepherd. Amen. I want to invite you today, if you made that profession of faith, to walk outside after the service is over in 45 minutes or so, 30, 30 minutes or so, excuse me, and I want you to meet me outside. I want to meet you and welcome you into God's family, but we continue. Next, we need to relax since he guides me. When a shepherd takes care of sheep, he, he makes them able to relax. You know why? Because they can hear his voice, and, and they know his voice, and they know his presence. It says that he makes me to lie down and green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. Relax. Take a breath. He's there to guide you. He leads you in the right path. You, you know sheep can't lie down if there's tension between them. That's why you can't sleep at night sometimes, because there's something between you and somebody else. But he makes sure the sheep... Reconcile and get along together so they can lay down. Sheep won't also lie down if they're hungry. He makes sure that they're fed. They also won't lie down if they're scared. So sometimes the good shepherd, the God of this universe, your God and my God, if you have chosen him, will make you lie down by feeding you, taking away the tensions between you and others, and making you do the hard work to make things right with others, and pro protecting you life from predators that seek to kill and steal and destroy and to wipe you out. Do you ever get scared? Do you ever get hungry? Do you ever feel like nobody's there? He promises that he is there. And because of that, you have no wants. And you know, when you've got Jesus, you've got everything. Somebody said it this way, you know what, you never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. And then when you understand that Jesus is all you've got, then you understand that Jesus is all you need. He is the good shepherd who's come to lay down his life for the sheep. Third, not only understand God wants me to pursue him and make a choice that gives all, all the time, relax since he guides me, but fourthly, allow him to set me right and make me straight. To set me right and make me straight. Say these words with me. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. So what in the world does that mean? When you're restored, it means that you're re-energized. You are refilled. You are refueled. You are rehydrated, if you will, if you are dried up and without water. He fills you back up in that kind of way. But there's also something that happens to sheep. Sometimes they get knocked down, and because sheep are kind of bulky, and they have a little more bulk than they need, sometimes they end up on their backs doing this. And ultimately what happens is they are completely open to predators coming to take their life. You know what the shepherd does? He reaches down. He picks them up. He puts them back on their feet, and the, the feet and the legs the arm that, that are literally lost circulation, he reaches down and he massages them and he brings them back to life. That's what restoration is. Sometimes, and some of you are in a period and a time of restoration in your life, maybe you need to understand that he is putting you back on your feet and then he leads you in the right way. It says that he sets my path straight. He leads me in the paths of the right way to go. Why? For his name's sake. Let me go back to it, ladies and gentlemen. Either he's God of everything or he's God of nothing. Either he is your good shepherd or you have some other kind of shepherd that you're still trusting in. And take it from me, the chief of all sinners in this room, when you trust in anyone and anything else other than him, it is bound to failure. And you are bound to desperation. 
You're going to always want, like John D. Rockefeller said, all I ever want is just a little bit more than I'm ever going to have. The same man who said that owned at that time one dime out of every dollar in America. The Lord is my shepherd. What else does that mean? It means to walk with peace and without fear. It means I can understand that I, I can walk with peace and without fear. Say these words with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There's a whole bunch of stuff, and I wish there was time to unpack all of it. But there's a valley of the shadow of death. The mountain of death or the circumstances of life sometimes loom over you so that you feel like they're greater than anyone or anything, even him. But you know what causes the shadow? The light shining over the great obstacle in your life causes the shadow. So when you're walking through the valley, you're walking through that valley. You're not staying in that valley. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. This life, again, is just preparation for the next. When we're walking through that valley, it's a, it's a valley of the shadow. And because there's a shadow, it means there's a light beyond whatever obstacles and whatever causes us to be stressed out in life. And that light is Him. It's Him. In the midst of your job change, in the midst of your marital stress, in the midst of your financial distress, in the, He is there. He's saying, there, there. My mind went back to, to Babe, the movie about the little pig that we saw years ago when my kids were little, back when the dinosaurs were on the earth and the pterodactyls were flying in the sky. <laughs> I thought about the shepherd taking care of those sheep. It says, even though I walk through it, I'll fear no evil. Then trust his presence and his pressure. Trust his presence and his pressure. What's up with that? Let me tell you what's up with that. Let's read the scripture with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. A rod was used to protect sheep from predators that would kill them. He would take that and <laughs> upside the head. He would use the staff to keep the sheep in line. Kind of like your mama does. Hey, uh-uh, back over here. Or your wife or your husband does. Mm-mm, mm-mm, we're kind of walking apart. Mm-mm. He taps his back in place. Literally. His presence, knowing that he has the rod to kill those forces of evil in our lives. And then the staff to tap us gently and to bring us back in line when we get out of line. Let me ask you a question. Any of y'all have been out of line this week? Any of y'all been out of sorts this week? Absolutely. And the rest of you are liars. <laughs> Next, live free when I feel surrounded by bad people. I especially feel surrounded by bad people at 4.30 in the afternoon on 4.85 headed home. <laughs> and whoever's idea it was to make that intersection from that way of 45 and this way to 45 to south down to here into God's country in heaven where Gaston County where God lives. You would be arrested. <laughs> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's what happened on Good Friday. We'll celebrate that this week. Tune in. We might have actually something for you on Good Friday, but whatever happens on Good Friday, we remember that on that Friday, Jesus took what they had used to celebrate Passover for years. Incidentally, if you've never received one of these from our church, this talks about the Jewishness of Jesus and the ways you can celebrate that. They're, at, they're free and out there on the table outside, but right now, we want you to remember Jesus as he said he wanted to be remembered, not by his birth. but by the body and the blood of Christ sacrificed for you and for me. If you did not receive communion elements, would you please raise your hand? The folks in the back can grab you some. I see some people up here that did not receive them. Would you just keep your hand up? And as they're preparing to distribute this to you, just keep your hands up high so they can see you. On the night before he was betrayed, he, he said something that they had celebrated for years in Passover, literally when, when God put had them put blood over the doorpost of their house and that they ate unleavened bread because they were in a hurry to leave Egypt. They'd been in slavery for 400 plus years and God's about to lead them out. Well now something they had been celebrating for thousands of years was now going to undertake a whole new meaning. 
Because the Passover was going to happen this night. And God was going to sacrifice his son on the cross the next day. As a perfect, sinless sacrifice so you don't have to be good enough because he's already been good enough for you. And now because he's been good to us, we get to be good to others. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. If you'll feel the top off and you'll take this little wafer, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Eat you all of it. And if you just made a profession of faith in Christ today, by the way, this is your first act of obedience to take this supper. Then he said, this is the blood of the new covenant written in my blood, poured out for payment. For your sins. Drink all of it. Thank you for your supper. Since you prepare a table before me. In the presence of mine enemies. You feel surrounded by bad people. He is there with you. Somebody's bullying you. He is there with you. sets us down. But here's where I want you to see something that is important. We, we can get lost in the eye of Psalm 23. I shall not want. He makes me lie down. He, he, Jesus does all this stuff for me. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to just chase it right straight to the bottom line. When, when you get God's heart, you want to give God's heart away. This is not just for you. You're never going to reach this place where you're on this pinnacle, you're going to hit every green light, all the bills are paid, you win the lottery every day, and your team, team wins the national championship all the time. The next thing we need to do is to overflow and to give to others. That's not what it said here. It says, you anoint my head with oil. Incidentally, they would anoint the head of sheep because they had sores and biting flies would bite them, and he'd use oil like a, a pharmacist or a doctor would use to to literally cover and to make things better. But then he talks about being at that meal again and how an overflowing cup is poured into our lives. There's a reason for that. Hey, listen, when you start to pour too much of God's drink, diet, cherry lemon sun drop, or whatever your favorite drink is, and, and it goes up to the lid and it, and it overflows, you want to make sure you got something under to catch it, right? And if you're like me, you don't want to waste any of that precious liquid that is brewed here in Gaston County. You pour it back into the cup. And if you've got plenty, you want to give it to others. You see, when you get God's heart, you want to give it away. Because God wants us to understand that we have something to overflow in the lives of others. And then finally today... I can do good everywhere I go, for as long as I live here, before I live there. I can do good all the days of my life, here, until I go live there. You know, that's what it's all about. I wish I could go around the room. I could start telling the stories about people I know that are like this, that, that live with overflowing lives. I, I wish I could give you a chance to talk about how, and if you stood to your feet, you're going to say, the best things I do in my life is when I give something to somebody else. And the most fulfilled I feel in my life is not just when I win the lottery or I get the promotion or when I do something else that causes great achievement to happen in my life or I pay off the bill. It's when I'm able to give to others. God put that in you and he put that in me. And we know things are right between you and me and God. When we want to overflow into other people's lives instead of just, well, i got to watch out for myself and uh, if I was going to take care of me, then you're still taking care of you. He's not God yet. Look what it says here. Surely, say it with me, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This means the overflow of what he pours in and through comes out of me to others. And I do good. And the overflow follows me wherever I go, and I pour it out to others while he's pouring it into me. You see, when I get God's heart, 
I get a heart for others. Pastor Ray. Yes, sir. So what you're saying is if you have God's heart living inside of you, then we should be pursuing others. Absolutely. Wow, that's awesome. So that may look different to each of you uniquely, but here at the point, church, that means a couple of things specifically in the season. I just want to share a couple of those Please do. really quickly. Um, first, as Pastor Ray was saying, some of you, God has blessed you financially. Maybe, maybe that's how God has just poured out blessings upon you. Well, next Sunday, we have something called our Easter offering. Our Easter offering does not go towards this place at all. It doesn't go towards salaries. It doesn't go towards paying for new chairs or new backdrops or anything like that. It goes 100% outside of the walls of our church, and it is split. 50% of it will go towards our local community, and 50% will go globally, anywhere in the world that we feel like God's calling us to love on people and to bless people. So that's next Sunday. So we just want you guys to be aware of that. Um, and that may be how God is asking you to pursue others in that respect. Uh, secondly, if you guys have your worship guide, I do want to point you to a couple of things. The first is the little insert that says the compassion experience. So that's going to be coming up very soon, and there's going to be a few different days of that. And I can't go into a lot of detail, uh, but we do have a video in a moment that will give you a little bit more about that. There's a way for you to serve and volunteer that day. And there's also just an opportunity for you to come and experience this. Uh, Compassion is going to bring in a trailer on our grounds in the parking lot. They're going to open it up, and this thing is like a transformer. It, like, grows. <laughs> and you have the opportunity to walk in, and you experience a couple of kids' stories, their life, what they went through, who were sponsored. And who knows, maybe you go through it, and God puts on your heart, you know what, That's you're going to pursue one of those kids. And maybe you want to sponsor one of those kids. And then finally, the other thing that's uh, happening locally, uh, Compassion's more on a global level, but locally, is the Convoy of Hope. And there's an insert in your worship guide for that as well. So this, again, we've got a little video clip we're going to show you because they've done a much better job at explaining what this is than I could. But this is a one big day event for our lo local families, uh, vulnerable children and families, people that are in need. And there's so many different organizations that are partnering with this in different booths, so to speak. Families can go and get groceries for free. Families can go in and kids, every kid that goes that day will get a new pair of shoes. And so you have an opportunity. All the information's on the insert, how you can sign up and get involved that day. But this video is going to give you guys a little bit more detail on the compassion experience and the Convoy of Hope. I was released from poverty in Jesus' name, and this is my story. First, the moment I stepped inside, I was amazed. It's basically this progression through this child's life. It takes you there. You get transported to another country, and you get to live that child's story. Mama has always worked whatever job she can find, but there is never enough money. I think hearing the sound of her voice, hearing her talk about her story. When I went through my own story, I was literally crying. My pictures, my photos, and it was very realistic. Jesus changed my life through the work of compassion. The stories and the way that they're told and weaved in and out of these rooms is pretty powerful. You have to do something that just calls you to act. I mean, I just think it's going to take their breath away. It's an unbelievable story of faith. Seeing it really changes things. It was moving. There's way more hope in this building than there is poverty. This is my story. What if you truly believed that you could change your city? Not the structures, the roads, or the traffic, but the people. What would you do? When you'd look around you, would you begin to see potential instead of poverty? Would your eyes be opened to the value of your neighbors? Would you start to realize that sometimes the simplest things make the biggest difference? That even something as basic as a haircut can inspire confidence? 
or that a new pair of shoes can not only change the way people walk, but the way they carry themselves. And will you begin to believe that providing health exams does more than just bring peace of mind, but has the ability to change hearts as well? Or that giving a child reason to smile can brighten their entire existence? And what if you believe that offering someone something as simple as a bag of groceries could be the one thing that brings hope to everything? I came to the Commonwealth Hope Outreach today for the services offered because they're needed and helpful at the moment, very helpful. Everybody's constantly making sure that we have what we need and if we need help finding anything and there's just lots of people to help you. It's given us hope today. That's the hope we needed. Yeah, <laughs> By giving back to your community, you'll play a part in changing the lives of families and giving them the hope they need. By coming together as friends and neighbors to pray, to give, and to volunteer, we'll transform lives. Hope starts here.